we are indeed diverse and yet can hear each other. What a way to begin this conversation and this time of participating together. A reminder of our diversity, a reminder of the way that we can indeed be in conversation. I bring you another reminder of that diversity and in fact one that is very hot off the press as the expression used to be. It was this week that the announcement was made that Canada, not Ottawa, but an alternative city, Toronto, has been chosen to host the Parliament of the World's Religions beginning of November 2018. And in all of the publicity that has been released about that and the press conferences, and feel free to take, there are some materials out on the table outside about the Parliament, in all of the materials and the publicity, it's been very clearly said that one of the reasons that Canada, specifically Toronto, was chosen was because it is one of the most, if not the most, diverse places in all the world right now. So in a way, we are beginning, continuing a conversation that is going to indeed continue. It's my privilege now to ask forward Ron Kuypers, who is the moderator of our very first panel, Solidarity in Diversity. Ron's going to come forward, and then he is going to invite those who are speaking to us and engaging with us in conversation forward. Ron. Thanks, Karen, and welcome everybody to uh, this conference, and thanks for coming. Uh, uh, thank all the speakers who offered their prayers and thoughts from the various faith traditions, and Elder McDermott especially for inviting us onto Algonquin territory. So uh, our first panel is Solidarity and Diversity. I'd like to maybe invite the speakers up now, and uh, then I'll introduce you, and you can sit behind your name tags. Uh, that'd be great, thanks. So I'll just tell you who I am. Um, uh, so my name is Ron Kuypers and I'm Associate Professor of Philosophy of Religion at the Institute for Christian Studies. And I also direct the Center for Philosophy, Religion and Social Ethics at the Institute for Christian Studies. And uh, I sit on both the planning and programming committees of the Our Whole Society Conference. So it's my great pleasure today to, to moderate uh, this panel on solidarity and diversity, um, especially as it relates to the multi-faith makeup of Canada's citizenry. So recent news, of course, is not wanted for stories describing the way this diversity presents an opportunity for conflict. Um, less reported, I think, but no less real, um, is the way that this diversity can become a source of dialogue, cooperation, uh, compassion, and strength to our uh, social fabric. And that is what we hope to discuss this morning. So I'd like to introduce all three speakers now right away. Um, uh, and I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Ingrid Matson, then from Palbinder Shergill, and finally from Dr. Andrew Bennett. So Palbinder K. Shergill is a trial lawyer serving on, oh, sorry, it's uh, Ingrid's going first. I have it in the wrong order on my page. Uh, so Dr. Ingrid Matson is the London and Windsor Community Chair in Islamic Studies at Huron University College at Western University in Canada. She's an expert in interfaith relations and a Muslim religious leader. From 2001 to 2010, Dr. Matson was elected and served as Vice President, then as President of the Islamic Society of North America in the USA. Uh, her writings focus on Quranic studies, theological ethics, and interfaith engagement. Uh, Dr. Matson has served on many boards, including the Interfaith Task Force of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, uh, the Council of Global Leaders of the C100 of the World Economic Forum, and the Leadership Group of the U.S. Muslim Engagement Project. So next, our next speaker will be Pal Palbinder Shergill. Ms. Shergill is a trial lawyer serving on the Board of Governors of the Trial Lawyers Association of British Columbia. Uh, she's a general legal counsel for the World Sick Organization, a human rights advocacy group. And in that capacity, she continues to be actively involved in numerous landmark decisions in the areas of human rights. Among many other accomplishments, she's an active public speaker speaking on such topics as the proposed Quebec Charter of Values, compassion and religion, and the relationship between faith and social justice. And our third and final speaker, Dr. Andrew Bennett. Dr. Bennett is a senior fellow at CARDIS, Canada's faith-based think tank, 
and Program Director of Cardis Law. Dr. Bennett served as Canada's first Ambassador for Religious Freedom and Head of the Office of Religious Freedom from 2013 to 2016, during which time he led in defending and championing religious freedom internationally as a core element of Canada's foreign policy. An academic and public servant, Andrew holds degrees in history from Dalhousie and McGill, as well as a PhD in political science from the University of Edinburgh. And prior to his appointment as Ambassador of Religious Freedom, Dr. Bennett served in a variety of roles in the federal public service. So would please join me in welcoming all three speakers. So we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Matson. Uh, each speaker will have 10 minutes to speak, and then it will be followed by a moderated discussion. Dr. Matson. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Okay, that's a better start. Uh, I am uh, a Canadian who went to the United States for my PhD and then stayed there to work for a while then happily came back to Canada after 23 years in the United States. I think the, America, the experiences I had in America are somewhat relevant for us as a positive and, and negative example, so that's going to feature into my presentation today. Um, in America after 9-11, a group of Muslims from uh, outside, of course, had declared uh, war on the United States, and given the explicit religious justification which is different from the cause, this forced American Muslims to be more explicit, forceful, and public in declaring their allegiance with their fellow citizens. Not that it wasn't there before, but it was implicit rather than explicitly stated in all cases. Uh, it was important to show, and, and maybe sometimes unfairly expected, to demonstrate the uh, commitment to upholding the safety and security of their country. Um, to demonstrate this, some Muslims went even further in joining the military, more joined the public service, and uh, ran for political office. For many, it was a, critical, a critically decisive moment when any fence sitting about whether a Muslim could be an American was forever decided and needed to be repeated explicitly over and over. But this movement towards solidifying an American Muslim identity was matched at the same time with a counter movement of groups long opposed to Islam and Muslims for reasons of political and religious ideology. They seized on this moment and have continued to do so ever since to claim that Islam is incompatible with democracy, pluralism, American values. Um, the uh, Center for American Progress has done a series of studies on the so-called Islamophobia network that is now a globalized network beginning in the United States but tries to spread this message across countries. While some uh, Americans who were afraid of Islam were simply ignorant of the diversity and richness of Islamic history, thought, and practice, the mission of these groups was not to illuminate, not to be fair and balanced, except in the way that Fox News lives up to that motto, but to deliberately exclude, stigmatize, and marginalize, and even provoke violence, in some cases out of a yearning for the eschaton, and in some cases because of a nexus uh, of their beliefs with white supremacism and fascism. Chris Hedges has written that war is a force which gives us meaning. War has the greatest rallying and unifying power. Of all the moments a nation memorializes, none have the lasting and emotive power of war. It is often difficult for nations to find anything else to spark an equal, equally unifying power. In this year, 2017, we Canadians celebrate our 150th anniversary, but many say that Canada was truly born in 1917 during World War I and especially with the Battle of Emmy Ridge. I grew up in Kitchener, Ontario, named for the man famously featured on the Canadian World War I recruiting posters who said, I want you to fight for your country. When I was growing up in Kitchener, I didn't know much about the man, except that it was hard to learn how to spell his name, which I had to write on every envelope when we used to send mail. But a number of years ago, when I was at an international conference, a distinguished Sudanese scholar I was chatting with asked me where in Canada I was from, and when I said Kitchener, she said, Kitchener killed my grandfather. 
And then I researched the man and re realized that uncomfortably that Canada did not have a virgin birth, but that our history and identity was linked with a violent global colonial project, not identical with it, but related certainly. And researching my city, I realized that my own ancestors, German Canadians who had settled in the area in the early 19th century, were deemed enemies too during that war that was overseas, and were told that being Canadian meant that they had to be English, and so their beloved Berlin was disappeared and replaced with Kitchener. The great North African scholar of the 14th century, Ibn Khaldun, often called the father of sociology, was the first to focus in detail on the causes and manifestations of social solidarity. He said, dealings with other people when there is oneness of purpose may lead to mutual affection, but where purposes differ, they may lead to strife and altercation. Thus, mutual dislike and mutual affection, friendship and hostility originate. This leads to war and peace among nations and tribes. Ibn Khaldun called uh, the group solidarity that that emerges out of a oneness of purpose, asabia. It, could really, it, it comes from asab, which is the nerve. So it's this really very, very deep, deeply felt, visceral sense of solidarity. What are its causes and sources? Blood ties, rites of binding into the tribe, religious solidarity, sometimes hunger. War catalyzes solidarity, but the risk is that it becomes an end in itself, filling the existential void and thus destroying society, or when ending, leaving the constant need to find a group to fill that primordial role of enemy. In America after 9-11, having to respond to this overreach of war gave a unity of purpose to a large swath of the faith community. After, after Abu Ghraib, a near cat, the National Religious Coalition Against Torture, campaign against torture, the most successful interfaith coalition in American history was formed, uh, reaching everywhere from evangelical Christian to uh, Orthodox Jew and everything in between. Not just religious groups, though, rallied for this. Secular groups did as well. The American Civil Liberties Union, Physicians for Human Rights, Amnesty International, united to fight against torture. In other words, to fight for human dignity. But once again, it is harder to fight for something than against an enemy of that thing, a clear evil, which is what torture is. Similarly, a new form of solidarity emerged among Sikhs and Muslims, not because suddenly we were aware of our shared values, but because Sikhs were being shot and killed mistakenly because their attackers thought they were Muslim. But the common need of survival, not to be shot and to not have our houses of worship burned down, provide the catalyst for joint action, cooperation, and in the process, we became friends. And from that platform came to a more principled ethic of the need for mutual respect, solidarity, upholding human dignity and religious freedom. Similarly, when emerging uh, stronger links between Islamophobia and, and anti-Semitism appeared, uh, we were able to forge more uh, principled partnerships with Jewish organizations and so, for example, my organization had very successful um, uh, projects with the Jewish Theological Society, the Union for Reform Judaism, creating curricula of mutually studying each other's religious traditions that are still used today in uh, mosques and synagogues all across America. So hardship can lead to common action, which can lead to solidarity, that can give birth to more principled ethics and a view of rights. We see that, for example, that, that when women were rallied to help support the war effort, or when uh, the military was integrated um, to support the war because of that urgent need, out of that emerged, not only from the common experiences, but a principle of ethic towards more women's rights, more racial equality after the war was over. The obligation of religious leaders, us, religious leaders, is to not to be a barrier, and more positively, to articulate theologies of religious pluralism and basic human dignity to give permission to the good instincts of ordinary people to do these things. I believe that in Canada, this, the recent Syrian refugee crisis uh, served as a similar mobilizing effort as torture did for American faith communities. This became 
a unifying cause for Canadians where multiple and diverse religious organizations and secular organizations united on the principle of human dignity said we're going to do something about it and we're going to do something together. The enemy of uh, that situation is uh, the degradation of human dignity. But this is our challenge. How can we keep alive a positive principle rather than always simply neg um, organize and have solidarity for a against an enemy or against a negative principle? It's never possible by our own efforts to have a truly fresh start in human relationships and societies. Anything we create is made from what already exists, and what is new cannot be placed outside of this world in a space untouched by history. As I say, even can Canada wasn't born out of nothing. It was born out of a context, a history that was certainly touched by, by violence. Only by the grace of God can something truly new come into being. The Quran says his command when he desires a thing is to say be, and it is. God's grace does not depend on our action, yet God created us as beings who must act so that we can grow. Blessed is he in whose hand is the dominion and he has power over all things, who created death and life that he might try you, and which of you is the best of works? God is the almighty, the all-forgiving. It is God's command that a people will not improve unless they make the effort to change themselves. The Quran says God will never change the blessings, which is graced upon a people unless they change their inner selves. Directing our will towards actions we believe will be pleasing to God, we trust that the Creator can bring about a dramatic change in our habits and patterns of behavior and in the world in which we live. Our instincts in human relations are often overwhelmingly pessimistic. We feel stuck in our histories and in the emotions which arise out of our histories. But believing in God's creative power, we have faith that it may be God's will that he will create love between you and those whom you now consider enemies. This is a Quranic quote, and what's particularly important about this is that, is that no one is identified as an enemy but those you now consider enemies. This is a question of perspective. We have perspective. And that is what needs to change. We need to change, and God can help us and will if we allow God to do so to create love where there's hatred. In that, I have faith for Canada. Thank you. Sorry, this is a little bit low for me, but <laughs> it's a good thing I wore my lower heels this morning. <laughs> so if I seem a little disoriented, it's actually because of the flurries of snow that I saw. And I know a lot of you are thinking that I probably don't know what snow is because I come from Vancouver. Um, but I have seen snow. We've had a very crazy winter. Um, I want to first begin by uh, extending my deepest gratitude to the Algonquin people upon whose unceded lands we are holding this conference. The question of this topic this morning um, and the issue that we've been asked to address is solidarity and diversity. Um, and as I understand it, um, we've been asked to sort of frame ourselves into to a few questions and thoughts, and I'd like to be able to address those. And the first question that I'm going to address is, what is Canada in terms of secularism? Are we indeed a, a country that practices exclusive secularism? If we are, should we now shift ourselves into practicing something called inclusive secularism? And if so, is there something that people from different religious communities and groups ought to do differently in order to make this inclusive secular secularism idea work? And so let's begin with, first of all, um, whether in fact we are a country that practices ex exclusive secularism. And when I speak of these things, I speak not as a religious leader, I speak simply as a Canadian, um, based on my own experiences, or more importantly, just my observations. 
And I think that if we cast about, we would probably say, yes, fairly well, we do practice this thing called exclusive secularism in the sense that when we look at our educational system, when we look at what is being taught in our public schools, uh, religion is probably a small, teeny, teeny fragment of the education that children get through their schools, public schools. And many would say that's a good thing. Uh, many would arguably say that uh, given the strife that religious movements such as the Crusades, or one could say in the historical context, or other uh, violent religious kinds of uh, activities that many organized religions have been involved in or have been blamed for over the course of history, one could arguably say that exclusive secularism is important in order to make a multicultural society work. In other words, in order to have a society where all faiths are respected, we simply obliterate faith from public discourse and dialogue. And so even though we all intuitively know if any of us have had children or if any of us uh, has, has been around children, that some of the very first foundational fundamental questions that a child asks is, who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning or purpose of my existence? And they may not frame it or articulate it in such deeper ways and meanings, but that idea of who I am, why am I here, is such a profoundly human experience. And yet, as a society, when we decided to take Christianity out of our public schools in order to accommodate multiculturalism, what we in fact did was we took all concept or ideas of who we are, this profound human expression of our existence, we completely annihilated them from our public schools as well. So children were permitted to ask, how is this made? What are the basic foundations or cornerstones of life from a scientific perspective? And we were able to accommodate thoughts, and science is extraordinarily important in advancing human thought. But what we weren't permitted to do was to assist them and guide them and encourage them to explore this entire other thought process that has pre-existed modern science. And that is, how have different societies and different peoples answered that question of who am I, why am I here? What is the meaning of my life? And so I say that when we have practiced this ideal of exclusive secularism, we have, in fact, thrown, really, the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. It was a laudable, laudable thing to do, to say that religion needed to be taken out of our schools in the sense that schools should not have been used as a vehicle to advance one religion over another. And secularism is about ensuring that the state does not favor one particular religious perspective over, over another, and that is an important ideal. But in my respectful view, what we have done, though, is we have artificially set our children up to believe that there is no other existence or way of thought or thinking, we have completely cut them off from an entire other part of human expression, and that is spiritual exploration. And so in my view, inclusive secularism is really about saying, how have we as different cultures and peoples throughout the course of human history addressed this issue? What does a Muslim say about who I am and where do I come from? What does a Christian say about who I am and where do I come from? Or a Baha'i? What does Aboriginal spirituality say about who I am and where I come from? Or Hinduism or Sikhism? There are profoundly different ways of approaching this. And I would say that equipping our children with being able to move forward in society and through educational systems with the tools to understand the world around them is a good thing. It's important to say to children, here are the different ways all of these different peoples 
have tried to answer this question. And we're not saying that this way is better or that way is better. But these are interesting and important questions and conversations to have. But when we strip that away and we say to them that we are going to ask you to artificially begin at point 20 and skip over points 0 to 19 of sort of human evolution and thought and philosophy and ideology, and now you can pick up your thought processes from here, how do we then expect them to be able to understand and respect the complex, diverse, and incredibly rich world around them? I don't think we can. I think that it is extremely difficult to raise children, to develop a society that is truly welcoming, different than tolerant. A tolerant society is one that simply says, I will allow you to be here in this space, but please make sure that you are seen but not heard. And so the seen but not heard is the rule that we apply for people of different faiths. We say, in public discourse, we do not have room for different faith traditions to express themselves, to talk about how should we deal with all of these other social issues that are happening in society. And I understand the reason and the impetus for that. I do. I understand that when we have had the abortion debate in Canada, sometimes that abortion debate has resulted in, in our historical past in violence. We have had violence directed towards homosexual community. And it's unacceptable. And yet, what we haven't been able to do is to somehow figure out that even though those types of irrational individuals may still be members of our society who may think that violence is an appropriate way of expressing their own mm -hmm. viewpoints, that that does not represent the vast majority of people of faith. The vast majority of people of faith are people who are prepared to have a conversation, who are prepared to respect others around them. So how do we enable that to happen? How do we ensure that we can have a dialogue and a conversation or provide educational information in our schools to our children without it appearing as if we are favoring one over the other, or not allowing room for other forms of thought, of atheism, of agnosticism. All of these other ways of thinking and being also have to be included in our society. And I've turned to a very interesting place. Um, one would argue perhaps not the natural place we turn to, uh, certainly in, in a lot of our religious freedoms cases that I've argued before the Supreme Court of Canada, um, but we turn to Quebec. Because Quebec, most interestingly, put forward a program called Ethics and Religious Culture through their educational system. And this program was, in fact, the subject of the Loyola decision that came out uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada a few years ago. But the interesting piece of this curriculum, and the most important piece, is that the impetus of it was from a profoundly important, thoughtful place. And that was that the then premier of Quebec, Jean Chret, had actually looked around other democracies in the world, Great Britain, um, he'd looked at uh, different Nordic countries, at Germany, the Netherlands, and through the course of that, looked at their educational systems to see how they dealt with and addressed differing religious perspectives in their educational curriculums. And he came back with a model that he decided he would like to try in Quebec. And so from 2008 onwards, Quebec has had this mandatory ethics and religious culture course that is taught through most of the grades. And it takes up a couple of hours a week worth of education, where during the course of this program, children are taught about different faith traditions. They're taught about how, you know, what, what are Sikh practices or what do Muslims believe and, and how, you know, what is the history of, of the Islamic faith and how does it relate. And they're taught to look at these particular ways of, 
of thinking and being not with the view in mind of encouraging them to adopt one perspective over another, but rather in order to try to see if there is a place for these children to be able to understand faiths and then develop from that their own ethical thinking, develop from that their own way of processing the world. In the rest of Canada, we don't have such a program. British Columbia, which I am intimately familiar with, provides a, a tiny little bit of programming in terms of uh, the educational curriculum on different religions, I think around the grade eight level or so. Um, and it's a short little program that talks, you know, over the course of a few weeks about different religions, but there isn't something in there that allows the exploration of thought, that allows the exploration of philosophical conversation. And so, in my view, as a country, we would be well served to attempt to try to expand ourselves and to include this conversation, which I think is a critical conversation. So do we as people uh, in Canada, and do we then ask people of different faiths to somehow behave differently in order to have this kind of a conversation in the public discourse? And it was interesting when I saw that question being posed to us as speakers because I thought, well, that's interesting. We would never ask that of somebody that wasn't a person of faith. What is it about people of faith that we feel the need when we start this conference to say, we need to have respectful dialogue. We need to be, make sure that we all listen to each other. What is it that we, all, we feel the need to actually reprimand and scold and teach even before they've uttered a single word? Is it because we have lulled ourselves into believing that all of these people are over here in this group and these are the people of, of different faith traditions versus the rest of us as Canadians who may not follow any faith tradition at all. So have we simply taken that us and them, us being a predominantly perhaps uh, Christian-based uh, society at the beginning of, of Canada's foundation, to and them being people of other faiths to now, because uh, the Christians have also been uh, relegated sort of to the sidelines outside of our public school system, now, the, the us becomes secularism and them becomes people of faith. And so I do believe that this conversation needs to be had. I don't know what the answers are, but I think it's important for us to expand our way of thinking because the profoundly important place where our children go every single day to learn about what it means to be a better human being, what it means to be a citizen of the world, is a place in which we can either provide them with all of the tools to be able to move forward in society or only give them some of the tools. But if only we give them some of the tools, then don't expect them to build a perfect house. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction earlier and, and to the organizers um, and for the opportunity to, to speak to you. I've been very blessed in being able to attend all three of uh, the Our Whole Society conferences and been able to, to speak at each occasion. Now I'm in a very different role, uh, but still passionate about these issues, uh, particularly around religious freedom and now how religious freedom impacts us in the public square. How do we find that genuine diversity, that genuine pluralism? So that's what I want to speak to you about today. In a truly pluralist democracy, acceptance of difference must include the right to hold different theological and different ethical and moral positions, even when they go against the prevailing spirit of our age. So long as these views are held and advanced peacefully, and do not advocate physical violence that would violate human dignity, these views must be able to inhabit the public space. We must reject an illiberal totalitarianism that seeks to establish 
socially correct and acceptable beliefs, treating any peacefully held contrary view as deviant and something to be silenced. There must be no totalitarianism of accepted belief or accepted opinion in our country. It is not by sheer accident that freedom of religion or conscience appears as the first fundamental freedom in Section 2A of the Charter. If a citizen does not enjoy the foundational freedom to live and exercise their religious beliefs both publicly and privately, and to have this freedom vigorously defended by all of our institutions, then we cannot build a truly diverse and pluralist society where difference is viewed in a positive light, not as something to be avoided in favor of some sort of mushy relativism. A true pluralism must embrace and enable difference, but not simply a subset of differences that may be permitted and emboldened by a given set of elites at a given moment in our history. This is an illiberal pluralism that embraces a closed secularism where the state imposes values and dictates what religious beliefs, what moral beliefs are publicly permissible. To paraphrase a prominent Catholic bishop, democracy has many merits, but it does not determine the truth. The freedom to practice one's deeply held religious faith, both publicly and privately, is a freedom that implicitly advances and supports this true pluralism by protecting and continually upholding difference. To champion religious freedom is also to implicitly accept that there are those in our common life who will hold and will promote beliefs, theological, philosophical, moral, and ethical, that many of us will vehemently reject. And that's OK. It is the proper role of the state to ensure that no one religious belief system, or for that matter, a secular belief system, dictates what one must believe and what one must do. All faith communities, along with political and ideological communities, must commit to inhabiting the public space in peace. They must commit to engage in activities that have as their ultimate goal the promotion of human flourishing, recognition of human dignity, and an acceptance of different beliefs coexisting in the public square. Freedom of religion or conscience is essential in the development and defense of a diverse society where human beings are able to flourish and their dignity be acknowledged. So how then does religious freedom reveal human dignity? As Paul Binder uh, pointed to, thanks for the setup, uh, freedom of religion relates directly to what Rabbi David Novak at the University of Toronto has called the metaphysical need within every human being. Or we can speak about, speak about the transcendent aspect of the human person. And this metaphysical need is related to some fundamental questions which people need to be free to contemplate and to hopefully answer in some way. Who am I? Who am I in relationship to you? Who am I in relationship to creation, to the world in which I live? Who am I in relationship to God or to a particular philosophy to which I choose to adhere? It can be argued that these questions fundamentally define the relationship between religious freedom and human dignity. If our concept of freedom is purely one of economic, social, and or political freedom, divorced from this existential freedom, as Paul Binder was pointing to again, then our participation in society will be frustrated. How we understand ourselves in a metaphysical sense, in a transcendent sense, cannot be divorced from our political, social, and economic selves. Indeed, in most of the world, religious faith defines political, social, and economic action. Canada's a bit of an outlier, along with a number of our Western European um, allies. All of these freedoms speak to human freedom itself and its defense so as to enable human flourishing. If people in our society, whether they be Muslim, Christians, Sikhs, or Jews, or people of no particular religious faith, 
if they are constrained in living out their faith through practice and how that faith defines their conscience and profoundly shapes their understanding of the human person, if this is frustrated, these people, including many of us, we might feel this, will become increasingly marginalized and our society increasingly atomized. The marginalization of people of faith and the diverse beliefs they profess have two consequences, both of which I would argue hamper the further strengthening of our common life. The first of these consequences, such a marginalization impoverishes our public debate by pushing out valuable perspectives drawn from deep wells of religious tradition. In so doing, people who profess these traditions view themselves as being undervalued within our political life and the religious beliefs they deeply hold as being unworthy of public consideration. Their ability to fully exercise their citizenship is thereby diminished as a result. The second consequence of pushing religious belief to the margins. As people of faith and their communities feel increasingly vulnerable and believe that they can no longer participate in the common life due to unreasonable constraints being placed upon their faith and their conscience, they may choose to check out of mainstream society altogether. While this may allow them to live their faith and support their faith-based institutions more or less independently, it represents a grave loss to our common life our common life becomes even more impoverished. And it's an essentially a failure of our political society to embrace these citizens. The state which acknowledges and respects religious freedom as being intrinsically linked to human dignity and intrinsically linked to the flourishing of a diverse society respects the sovereignty of religious bodies, respects the sovereignty of faith communities and their members to exercise their faith freely and in good conscience in both their public and their private lives. Likewise, members of all faith communities must respect the values of our liberal democratic society. In particular, the rule of law exercised by the state in so much as, in so much as those laws are just, that they do not counter the moral law and are ordered towards the common good, the common good and the flourishing of all members of society. A true pluralism respects disagreement, often profound disagreement, between people of different faiths, ideologies, and backgrounds. I disagree profoundly with Ingrid and Paul Binder on theological questions. Yet, I am called to recognize within them the dignity that they possess as human beings and from my own Catholic understanding, that incarnational reality, that the image and likeness of God is present in them. In building our common life, we must seek to see this in every individual human being, and to build a society in which people flourish and are able to live their lives of faith fully, both publicly and privately. We are not to privatize religious faith. That is a, a post-enlightenment myth that we really need to reject because it does a disservice to people of faith and again the traditions that faith brings to our common life, to our debate, and to and allowing us to live in a more uh, peaceful manner. In building this common life, there must be the space to differ and not to defer, to have the freedom to live a public faith and not be driven to privatize one's faith in order to be accepted in the public square. A liberal democracy, a truly diverse society, a pluralist society, needs to be strong enough in its embrace of the rule of law, of freedom, and human rights to guarantee that religious differences, and differences in belief more generally, differences that often have sharp edges, let's call them, can exist. A liberal democracy that is diverse protects and opens wide the public square for these disagreements to exist. The public square also beckons us, calling us to meet each other there in our differences and in our diversity, and there to encounter our shared humanity in solidarity with one another. Thank you.
Thank you, all three speakers, for those thought-provoking uh, talks. Um, we now have uh, around 35 minutes for uh, discussion, so uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, before we get into that, I'd just like to ask people when they ask a question to, number one, ask a question. Uh, number, number two, if you could identify a particular speaker that you'd like to answer the question, that would be helpful as well. And then, and then, uh, uh, and engage the the actual uh, talk that the speaker gave would be, would be great as well. So. I was wondering if there was a way to articulate on the point made by the last speaker that all religious groups should be prepared to obey the, the rule of the law, but there is a qualification that if the laws are unjust or increasingly immoral, um, how can we? Make that a bit clear because that, that's the sort of weapon that's used against the Muslim community saying, oh, you're, you're obeying your, your religious law over this, but how can we, at a common interfaith language, articulate the idea of having um, a moral conscience that is different from codifying laws? Um, well, this is probably one of the greatest questions to address. Um, without getting into Thomas Aquinas, you sort of need to look at the question of how the moral law and temporal law or positive law encounter one another and engage. And I think the point that I was trying to make is that first and foremost as citizens, especially with a, a representative democracy that we have, um, we have an obligation to obey the law and we have an obligation to uh, be loyal citizens. And I think it participate actively in our institutions, uh, to pay our taxes, to do whatever we're called to in terms of, in terms of our, our citizenry. But at the same time, those of us of faith are called by our faith, which must be, I would argue, as a, certainly as a, as a Catholic, that is our first identity. I am first and foremost a follower of Jesus Christ. Being a Canadian comes down below that. But that informs everything else. It informs my being a Canadian. It informs my being a, a son to my parents, a friend to my friends. Um, and so, I need to understand that, yes, I have this particular duty to my country and to obeying the law so that 